Claudius is a Roman tribune. He's working for Pontius Pilate. Uh, in the movie Risen, he has the responsibility to oversee the crucifixion of Jesus, making sure that he's dead. And then, in the movie, and, and again, I understand this is a movie, okay? And so there's not, there's, what's it called, storyline to bring out the, the facts that really are from Scripture. Um, what I, and I have seen the movie, and I appreciate that the movie really holds to Scripture, even though it will use some creative license, okay? So when words are said, verses are quoted or whatever, they might be at a little bit different timing or something like that than you expect. Nevertheless, they are there. And the truth is there. And Claudius is this tribune who is now given the responsibility to find the body of Jesus. It was some of his men who were supposed to guard the tomb. He actually starts investigating their, their story in which they are told to tell a story that is not true. That Jesus' disciples had come and stolen the body. Well, that being the case, since that's the story that, that Claudius has, Claudius decides, fine, we'll find that body. And they begin digging up every, every fresh grave and opening up every fresh tomb and searching around for the body of Jesus. Hey, remember, this is not a pretty body. This is a body that's been tortured with a Roman whip. That means it's been literally torn apart, okay? It's, it's like nasty. And then hung on a Roman cross, which is one of the worst ways that a person can die. And just to be certain, a spear has entered his side and water has gushed out from the heart and the lungs. And that body is what Claudius is searching for. Who's he going to check? Well, eventually he's going to find the disciples. And the clip we're about to show you is of Mary Magdalena. Do you remember her? She's the woman who took her hair in incredibly expensive perfume and with her tears washed the feet of Jesus. The woman whom the religious people said, doesn't he know who's touching him? A prostitute. She's the woman whom Jesus blessed with forgiveness. She's the woman who anointed his body for the tomb, right there with her tears. And she's one of the people in the story whom Claudius interviews. Let's listen in on the conversation. Why did you run from us? Instinct. I've seen you before. My other life. Yes, yeah, she was death. You were there beside his mother. Was she also the woman with you at his tomb? If you knew what happened there, who cares what sees? Enlighten me then. It's beyond us. Spare me the riddles and zealot babble. Where did you take Yeshua? He's right here. Is he a goblin? A sprite? Alive again somehow? Open your heart and see. I see delusion. To keep a crusade alive. I could have what I want. Pulled from you. Put you to death like that. It doesn't matter. Wow. Uh, a matter. No. Then give me the others and I'll grant you freedom. I'm already free. Show me the Messiah. Alive or dead. 
Show me those who follow him. You look for something you'll never find trivial. You look for the wrong thing. I am free. <coughs> and you look for the wrong thing. Because he's looking for a dead body. <laughs> and he'll never find it. Because Jesus Christ is alive. So for the next few weeks, um, we're going to go through and see some of these clips and try to look at the resurrection of Jesus and examine it. And, and really, we probably should question ourselves. Do we believe it's real? Do we believe it's true? And if so, friends, if we believe Christ rose from the dead, shouldn't that make a difference in our lives? And shouldn't, therefore, we then invite people to that same freedom? to the same freedom that not only Jesus bought and paid for for Mary Magdalene, but that he bought and paid for for you and for me. can't ignore uh, a significant event that took place this week. Justice Antonin Scalia, his body was laid to rest yesterday. Um, he's dead. Uh, we know where his body is. Uh, even if in, at some time talk, there was talking about him cremating, I don't know if they did that or not, I know there was a casket there and all, uh, but even he was Cremated. We know where those ashes are. The fact is, he's dead. But a faithful man of God no longer serves on the Supreme Court. Regardless of your political position, and uh, the fact is, is that there are people on both sides that recognize this is a very, very significant moment in, in our nation. Standing at four and four, Justice Scalia was a man who was committed to his faith in Jesus Christ. So committed that it affected and influenced what he did every day as he sat on the court. As he taught law and taught constitution, it influenced everything. It influenced the way he raised nine children. He believed in and had a faith in Jesus Christ. It's what influenced him to have an incredible friendship <laughs> with a Justice Ginsburg who is at a totally polemic view of, from him on the Constitution. <laughs> totally polemic. And yet Justice Scalia believed in love and he believed in trying to honor God with his life regardless as to whether there would be people who would be hostile and even hateful towards him. And some of that's happening right now. And we simply need to thank God that God puts people in positions of responsibility who love him and want to honor him. And literally, he calls us to be his witnesses wherever we're at. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the other most part of the world. God gives us that responsibility as soon as we come to know him personally. And we're not supposed to sit on it. Tim had a birthday party recently, and he has a, I guess you'd call her a girlfriend, I'm not sure. <laughs> he has a friend who's a girl that he's really attracted to. <laughs> Is that a girlfriend? <laughs> and he invited her to the birthday party, and she really didn't know anybody else there. And he was a bit frustrated because some of the, his friends who are a part of his new worship and community and church that he's forming, who are supposed to be helping grow this brand new ministry, 
were there at the party and nobody got up to talk to her. He took her around and introduced her to people and yet she felt unwelcome. Another girl at the party who also was unchurched was there because she had been invited and she actually came up to, to Tim and said, nobody's talking to me. Now, isn't this a kind of a serious thing? <laughs> you know, okay, fortunately it's a birthday party, so no, it's not a church event, right? Wrong. <laughs> Where the church is is a church event. <laughs> okay. And so here's people not going, going up to these other guests and strangers and helping them feel welcome. At our life group yesterday, the, a couple of men were talking, and there's a man, a man in the group who actually is going around the community smiling at people. Amen. Oh, my. <sighs> and you know what? He's not letting people off the hook. He's not just smiling at, at them. He's waiting till he sees their eyes and then smiling. And he says they're smiling back. In the same conversation, one of the other men said, well, you know, on Sundays I wait for people to come greet me. And in fact, and I could get this wrong, and he'll hopefully forgive me later, but he said something to the effect of, I wait for people to come greet me, and I figure if they didn't come greet me, then it's not my fault. I didn't have to go greet them either. Because they obviously didn't come and be friendly to me. Now, hold on here. And this, this friend knows that I have a pretty strong feeling in opposition to his thoughts. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're sitting here, is it your responsibility to sit there and wait for people to come to you? No. We have fallen into a mentality that says, if the church is here, they will come. That's a totally even mistake on the movie. If they build it, if you build it, they will come. Okay, that was a mythological movie, folks. The fact is is that we're sitting here waiting in a building and saying, okay, if we're sitting here, they'll come. If I sit here on a Sunday morning, they'll come and greet me. <laughs> Are you one of those sitters? Waiting for people to come to you? Waiting for them to say, I'm going to hell. Please tell me how to get to heaven. I haven't noticed many do that. But the fact is, is that there may be some who will literally try to have to get our attention to say, please tell me about Jesus. Acts. It's the beginnings of the church. Chapter 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions to the Holy Spirit and to the apostles he had chosen. Luke the doctor, the Gentile, incidentally, writer in the New Testament. Gentile, right? Not a Jew. Gentile believer came to know Christ in the Paul's ministry. Luke says, I want to tell people about what Jesus taught. I've had the privilege of meeting some of these incredible men of God who saw and touched and felt, sat down and ate with, fished with, listened to, breathed with, walked with, and they believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. They learned from his lessons, and I had the privilege of listening to them and talking to them and hearing from them, and I believe it too, and I got to tell people I know the same thing. In fact, I'm, I'm so committed to doing this that I got to get stuff written down. Not on paper, it was papyrus or clay, right? <laughs> Think about how much work this was for him. But he says, I've got to get this down where this can be heard and taught and remembered by other people. I've got to pass on these things that Jesus taught. And he says, and I did that in my other book. I talked about the teachings of Jesus. Uh, what was Luke's other book? Some of you are afraid that this is a trick question, so you don't want to answer. You know, don't want to be wrong on Sunday. Okay. It's Luke. Okay. 
I'll tell you if I'm giving you a trick question, okay? <laughs> it's the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. Matthew, Mark, what? Luke. There you go. I'm impressed, okay. So he says, uh, he says in, in the former book, I told you about all the things that Jesus taught. If you were to look at the 24th chapter of Luke, you might see some of what Jesus taught. Jesus said in verse 46, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer, what? And rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in the name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands, blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. In my former book, I told you about all the things Jesus taught. And at the core of what Jesus taught was, I'm going to die, I'm going to be crucified, and I'm going to rise again. And then I'm going to send you guys out to preach forgiveness of sins for everyone. Now you go back and you wait. It's kind of interesting. Do you know, did you hear the city, the place where they went? The place where they go is Bethany outside of Jerusalem, about four to eight miles, if that. Bethany, it's the place where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived. It's the place where Lazarus was raised from the dead as well. An incredible location. And there he's going to now bless them and ascend into heaven, and you're going to get that cheesy ending in the movie, according to Medved. <laughs> And don't be upset with Medved, okay? He really gave a really, really good, rich evaluation and assessment of the movie. And here he is, a Jewish guy, saying, go see the movie. It's, he says, it's as powerful as the passion of the Christ. And, he's, and here's the other thing that Medved said about it. It's more realistically. It's so realistic up until the cheesy 10 minutes. <laughs> now... Hopefully, I'm stirring your interest to go see what the cheesy 10 minutes is, okay? <laughs> or, or at least to maybe see the movie. Or maybe even, oh, oh no. Maybe even take somebody with you who's unchurched, because this is not really a Bible movie. This is not one in which they're just dressed in their bathrobes and, you know, <laughs> you, you know how we, we do the, <laughs> the plays, right? This is an incredible realistic depiction, first off, of the crucifixion of Christ. And if you don't like blood, I'm sorry. The cross was bloody. It was horrible. And the depiction is rather incredible of the death of Christ on that cross. Luke says, Jesus taught us. And in my former book, I wrote down things that I could remember that he taught us. And that's one of our responsibilities, isn't it? To go and teach what we've learned about Jesus. Verse 3, Acts 1. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He tells his disciples, after he's risen from the dead, folks. And by the way, how many of you know ghosts? A ghost. Yeah, personally know a ghost. <laughs> Okay, there's all kinds of ghost stories, ghost movies and stuff like that out there. <laughs> Casper, even the friendly ghost, can walk through walls and stuff like that. But one of the problems Casper always had was he couldn't eat. Okay? It doesn't happen. Ghosts can't eat. What does Jesus do with his disciples? Luke says, well, they sit down with his disciples and he what? Eat with them! This is an incredible body, isn't it? 
because this is the same guy who all of a sudden just appeared in the room. He didn't come through an open window or an open door. He simply was there. And he sits with them. And while he's there and sitting with them, Thomas comes in and Thomas touches him and feels the places where the nails went in and feels where the straw beer went in and who recognizes, oh my, touches him. And then the body goes again. He disappeared. Most people, incidentally, who are going to have a figment of their imagination do not touch things. Okay. Now I understand, if you're on morphine or something like that and you have a hallucination, it feels really real. Talk to somebody who's had a morphine hallucination and they still believe that whatever they saw really was there. The bugs crawling down the wall, you know, the, the doctor and doing something weird with those bugs and putting them in their body or who knows what, okay, go do the weird stuff. Okay, they believe that, but they couldn't ever touch it. And they couldn't eat with this person. And Jesus is risen, and they see him, and they eat with him, and they touch him, and he blesses them. And then he says, now wait for the Holy Spirit. Wait for the Holy Spirit. This is a conversation that he's been having with them for quite a while, in fact. He's actually said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you can be also. And in that preparation, he says, when I get there, I'm going to get this place ready for you. But until then, I'm going to send the comforter, the Holy Spirit, the one who is going to come alongside of you and encourage you. Here, he says, he's going to be the one who's going to empower you. And here's one of the challenges. Some of us are a little bit afraid of the Holy Spirit. And one of the reasons why we're afraid is because there's some weird people who believe in the Holy Spirit, right? And they do some weird things. And we don't want to be weird. And don't want to do weird things. So we don't want to be like them. And the problem is, is that we are actually then limiting the power of God coming into us. Because, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, in fact, Holy Spirit, you did that back then. But no, you don't do that anymore. Where did the Bible say that? See if you can find the place where it says that the Holy Spirit stopped filling up people. Stopped empowering them. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, Romans 12, 1 Peter 4, Ephesians 4. The Holy Spirit gifts and anoints and empowers people to do ministry. And watch out if you're doing ministry with your own flesh and not the Spirit's power. But here's the beauty of it is, when you're working in the Spirit, when the Spirit of God is filling you up to overflowing, that's when lives get changed. That's when you see God make a difference in people's life. That's when you know who you're supposed to invite over for dinner because Jesus has them ready to say, I'm going to hell. Tell me how to go to heaven. Sorry, Amy, you're sitting in the front row. <laughs> Wait for the Spirit. In Luke 10, Jesus says, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two uh, ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. The harvest is great. There's an incredible need right around us. There are people around you who do not believe and know that Jesus really loves them. They shop with you. They eat in restaurants with you. They work on your car. They get gas when you're getting gas. <coughs> Their dogs bark when your dogs bark. <clears throat> there are people all around you who don't know Jesus. And the Holy Spirit wants to fill us up to be those witnesses. Stephen Cole said, we cannot witness effectively for Christ unless we rely upon the Holy Spirit to produce godliness in our daily lives and to use our verbal witness as we have opportunity. There's not a single person here who can convince another person to be saved. You can't do it. 
You can't force them, talk them into it, make them believe. That has to come from the inside of a person's heart and soul. But the Holy Spirit can speak to that heart and soul and give that invitation and put you in a place like God put Barnabas when Saul needed to hear the truth. Like God put Philip when the Ethiopian eunuch was reading Isaiah and needed to hear the truth. And if you are allowing the Spirit to work in you, God, the Spirit will guide you and speak through you and work in your life. Acts 1, 6 to 8. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They're out at Bethany. Okay, they've seen him now for 40 days, Acts says. They've been visiting with him. He's appeared to at least 500 of them, to the disciples on multiple occasions. He's walked on a road and eaten with them. He's sat down at a table with them. He's cooked fish for them. He's provided for them. He's blessed them. And now 40 days is up. It's 10 days before the Feast of Tabernacles, 10 days before what we refer to as Pentecost. And Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. They gather around him and ask him, Lord, is it time, Jesus? Is this the moment that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are the Romans out of here, Jesus? And are you finally going to do what we've been all waiting for? Well, here's how they said it. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses until the whole world hears. Until the whole earth can rejoice. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Oh, brothers, I've got so much more planned. You have a responsibility, guys. You're going to continue my ministry. You're going to take the kingdom to the whole world. And you're going to start in Jerusalem, the place closest to you, place where it's easy for you. It's a place where you understand people. They talk like you. They sound like you. They eat the same food as you. Their language is exactly, you understand their jokes, okay? The slang and all that, it's all the same for you. You're going to go to Jerusalem first. Then you're going to go to Judea, Samaria. That's going to be a little harder for you. They speak English, but they have a southern drawl. They eat hominy and grits, and you don't. Catfish and stuff like that. But Well, okay, you get the point. You're going to go to that place that's just a little bit different than you. They may have your language and some similarities with culture, yet differences as well. And then he says, and then you're going to go to people who, you, you, you can't speak Chinese. You don't know how to speak to the Indonesians. Not only do they have these hundreds of different languages on all these multiple different islands, but you just you can't communicate with them at all. Because you can't even get to the island, let alone understand their language, and you have no way of translating the word of God over for them in their language because they're in all these different places. 200 different, wasn't it, that Patrick told us about? People groups, language groups. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will get the resources to take, the, take Christ to the islands of Indonesia. <clears throat> there probably is a point that one, one needs to make at this moment. Maybe several. It says, you shall be my witnesses. This is not a pro just a prophecy, it's a command. Prophetic word. You're going to go be witnesses and people are going to come into the kingdom of God because of you. Prophecy, right? Command as well. You're going to go and be my witnesses. Go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Lo, what? I am with you always. Where's Jesus? Jesus is at the right hand of the throne of God. It's his spirit. The Holy Spirit 
that is with us. I understand that there are some, maybe even people here this morning, who would say, well, the only way you can prove you have the Holy Spirit is to have a specific gift. Now, frankly, I have to tell you that I believe in all of the gifts that are in the New Testament, and I think they're all still present today. Obviously, that may cause you some other controversy and conflict. But the fact is, is every single one of the gifts I think are still present. I do not think that God stopped doing miracles just because the canon was completed in the year 300 approximately. But that God continues to pour out his spirit today. But here's another thing, and this also will separate me from some. The scripture seems to tell us that all believers, all Christians have the Holy Spirit. All Christians. Romans 8 verse 9 tells us this. And in fact, he even says, get this one, if you don't have the Spirit, then you do not belong to Jesus Christ. And he doesn't say there, and I apologize if I offend you, but he doesn't say there, if you're not a healer, you don't have the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say, if, if you can't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. And I appreciate the fact that my brothers in the assembly of God have started saying, Okay, Bill, we accept you. You're a believer, whether you speak in tongues or not. <laughs> I guess it's kind of like the Pope who finally said, oh, wow. back at John Paul, what, what was it, 1970s, when he finally said, okay, you Protestants, you are Christians. <laughs> it, it's kind of interesting. How, how, how do we determine? Be, because if you belong to Jesus Christ, if you've accepted that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, rose from the dead, and you've now identified with him, and baptism is an incredible easy way to do that, if you've done that, where's Jesus? His spirit is living in you, and you belong to him. And we ought to start making use of that power to serve him. Because we are all missionaries. The whole church, each member of it, must take up this task. All of us who have heard the apostles' teachings, who have experienced Jesus Christ at work in our lives, all of us have the responsibility to be his witnesses. Richard Longnecker says, this commission lays an obligation on all Christians. The Christian church, according to Acts, is a missionary church that responds obediently to Jesus' commission. Let's go on. After he said this, after he said, the, wait for the Holy Spirit, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him. Some call it the Shekinah, the glory of God. A cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking to intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. What's he say? Guys, didn't he tell you to do something? Do you remember what it was? Go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. They're in Bethany. It's only a few miles walk. Go to Jerusalem and wait. In 10 days, the Spirit's going to get there. That's not really that long, is it? 10 days. Holy Spirit's going to come. Fill them up. And wow, read Acts 2. Read Acts 2 and see what happens when the Spirit comes upon the church. Or Acts 10, when the Spirit comes upon Cornelius and then Gentiles. See, read the whole God, book of Acts for the, the acts of God through God's people and see what the Holy Spirit does. By the way, read Acts 29. Some of you know that Acts 29 is not in the canon. It's to be written by us. Acts 28 just stops. Paul's in prison. He's not even killed yet. It just ends there. Because Acts 29 is about what's going to happen as we serve Jesus Christ. Are you doing the work of God? You know what? If you're 88 years old, God still has work for you to do if you're sitting here. 
Jan's poking Virgil. <laughs> he was awake. <laughs> I'll make sure he was before I said it. <laughs> Are you doing the work of God? Because if you're alive, you have responsibility to continue to do the work of God. And the most important, nothing comes close. Responsibility you have is to help other people hear about Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Bob Deffenbaugh said, and so it is that we come to the importance of the ascension to Christians today. It is not primarily to be viewed as the conclusion of our Lord's life and ministry, but as the introduction of a new phase of his ministry through his church, empowered by his spirit. The assurance of his return and the measure of his presence and power in these intervening days is to be found to a great extent in his ascension. Oh, wow, what a savior. Stephen Cole said this, as we saw when we studied Jesus' ascension in Luke 24, it not only means that he has all power and authority, but also that he has made one offering for sins for all time. Thus, we can confidently proclaim forgiveness of sins in his name to everyone who repents and believes in him. His place at the right Father's right hand also means that he is interceding for his saints. Thus, we can be assured of his care for us when we suffer persecution for the sake of the gospel. The fact that he is coming again and we must give an account to him should also motivate us to be faithful to the mission he has entrusted us. Men of Galilee, why are you standing there gazing at the heavens? Didn't Jesus tell you to go back and get ready for the coming of the Holy Spirit and to get prepared for the ministry that Jesus is leaving in your hands? Why are you staring at heaven? Get to work, guys. Get to work. Oh, why are you all still here? Get to work. the world and people you know people you know don't understand that God loves them unconditionally but they know something about you do they know what you believe and have you loved and respected them enough to tell them Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, this is Hebrews chapter 10, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. That's why we are here. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am. I've come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. Once and for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered, this priest being Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Interesting. What does God want from us. Kill animals in order to put blood on an altar in order to somehow have sins covered? Uh, he said, that doesn't, that doesn't count. What does he want from us? To do the will of God until Jesus returns. And when Jesus returns, then he'll say, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with what I gave you? What did you do 
with what I gave you. Granted, if you have not accepted what he gave you, in other words, allowed, accepted, believed he died on the cross and rose from the dead for you, then you don't have responsibility to tell anybody else. But are you a Christ one? <coughs> are you a Christian? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Then Jesus Christ is coming back and he's going to say, how did you do? What did you do? What are you doing for me? Hebrews goes on. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Thank you, Jesus. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, we no longer have to go through all that ritual. And if you want to see what you don't have to do, read Leviticus and see about all the bloodletting that had to occur just to get to go to the temple. And we don't have to do that. We get to enter the holy of holy places because of the blood of Jesus Christ by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we professed for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, poke your neighbor quick, please. Just poke him. Okay. Just poke your neighbor. Poke, poke him. Because it says, let us, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as our summer are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Is Jesus coming again? Yes, he is. Is he coming this week? He is for somebody. He is for someone. Pray that's not somebody that you care about whom you haven't shared with. Easter's coming, folks. The test of whether we really believe in Easter is what we tell other people. Maybe that's why Jesus set aside baptism. It's a simple act of obedience and submission that says, hey world, hey friends of mine, I believe in Jesus. And I believe he's risen from the dead. Do you? Almighty God, the resurrection is something that intellectually pretty much we all say we believe. But we confess, God, that it is beyond us. It is more incredible than we probably totally comprehend. And our grasp of it is limited by our, by our knowledge, by our weak understanding, by our humanity. God, help us to believe even more and to be so motivated by the fact that like the disciples, like Mary Bag Magdalene, we'll even die because we're already free. And we have something that it would be selfish to keep to ourselves and sinful not to obey Christ's command. So Holy Spirit, Anoint us, empower us, fill us to overflowing to go and be your witnesses. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.